So hi everyone, welcome to our last panel, Go Forth and Scale, Relationships, Resources, and ROI. My name is Maria Lisa Sesa. I'm the founder of Reader Good, a communications consulting firm rooted in storytelling. Previously I worked in the mayor's office, and then before that I was a reporter at the San Antonio Express News where I covered education and a host of other things that they needed when they needed someone to fill in. So we are joined today by Andrea Figueroa, Executive Director of Martina Street Women's Center. Ruben Ramos, Vice President for Corporate Responsibility and Reputation at BBVA Compass. And Leah Rosenar, did I say that correctly? Yep. President and CEO of Girls Inc., where I had my first and hands down my most fulfilling job ever. Um, so I want to start. I want to start with some working definitions to make sure that we're all on the same page. I think that's super helpful. I think we throw around terms like digital inclusion, digital divide, and I think most everyone in this room knows what they are, but I just want to define them um, for folks that maybe don't know or aren't sure. The digital divide is defined as the gulf between those who have, who have ready access to computers and the internet and those who do not. And then digital inclusion ensures that individuals and disadvantaged groups have access to and skills to use information and communication technologies and are therefore able to participate in and benefit from today's growing knowledge and information society. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, I wanted us to start by talking a little bit about y'all's concept of San Antonio's digital divide. What does that mean to you and how do you see that manifest in the communities that you serve? I don't know if we want to just go in order, whoever wants to go first. Ladies. Sure. I'll start. <laughs> I'll start. I'm, never, I'm never shy. I'll start. Uh, what it means to me is simple. Access and opportunity. Access and opportunity. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, we, girls Inc., uh, our mission is to inspire girls to be strong, smart, and bold. We do that through programs um, after school, during summer, spring break. We'll talk about after school. Uh, we talked earlier today about the homework gap. Here's a very simple, uh, unfortunately, example of what we mean about, for what I mean about the digital divide. After school program, uh, fourth grader in SAISD uh, had a two-page worksheet, math worksheet. Um, it was an online textbook, okay? The only way that these girls could do their homework that night, finish the worksheet, was connectivity. You have to have a and I wouldn't even say tab was difficult because you had to answer some questions that um, kids are usually more nimble than I am, so maybe a tablet, but a computer. All right, so uh, after school we have connectivity at our place. We pulled up the textbook, we're working through the worksheet. Uh, grandma comes to pick her up. Time to go home. Come on, time to go home. Can't wait anymore. Time to go home. Not done with the worksheet. The student wants to finish her work, doesn't want to not get her work done for the next day, all right? Um, I'm having problems working through it with her because I'm used to having a piece of paper and being able to do this, but we're working on it on the screen. Um, I'm like, okay, no problem, I'll print this for you. Right, I'll print the two-page worksheet, take it home, finish it. This is my, my lesson. These online digital textbooks are smart enough not to be able to print. All right, copyright, new to me. I'm like, okay, me, problem solver. There's a way around this. I can screenshot it, print screen, right? right. Easy. The thing comes out pixelated. Oh, come on. Because the, the companies are smart enough to figure out the technology that you can't do that, <laughs> print screen. So once again, uh, grandma's getting frustrated because, you know, things to do at home, gotta go. <laughs> um, students frustrated because wants to finish her homework, you know, but there is no way to get that done at home. Access, opportunity. For me, that's what the digital divide is about. The workaround we figured out, you can take a picture of the screen on my, my phone, and then email me the picture, it was lousy but we kind of got some of the questions figured out. But that was the workaround. Access, opportunity. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, uh, and I think I would add an and to that. Um, everything that, that Leah said, 
we experience as well with our girls and the women that we serve uh, because you know most uh, of the women that we serve also uh, need some sort of extra help that's why they're in our center to begin with so they need basic needs they need all types of stuff and and currently right now <clears throat> the best way to do that is is online right there's there's a lot of things that happen online and when they come to us we're able to sort of bridge that gap with them um, but in addition to that what the digital divide looks like to me is a denying of the right to communicate properly or with uh, uh, the, the human right of communication, right? So if we are looking at the history of San Antonio uh, and we look at where investment was placed in San Antonio and why investment was placed in San Antonio, then this is just another, another iteration of that same treatment and lack of investment in certain communities. And we're all here talking about economic growth and we're talking about you know, the return on investment. Uh, the return on investment is making sure that our students have the ability, and it's not even about an equal playing field, right? Everybody says like a level playing field. It is, uh, is we are playing catch up with our students. It's not a level playing field. Um, and, and this is a tool, technology is a way for us to get even further on that road to catching up. Um, so yes, I see all of the, the obviously, the, it's all about a human story. It's a human story of uh, not being able to access. Uh, but, and that human story also is about the systems that exist uh, in the city and other cities around the country being the 17th worst connected city in the nation um, of, of the acknowledgement of why this is happening and why this is happening now and to whom it happens to all the time. So that is always in my head <laughs> as we are talking about this digital inclusion conversation. Uh, because if we don't admit we have a problem, then we're not going to get to the right solutions. So. Okay, so I'm just going to play off what these two ladies said to my left and to my right. I'm Ruben Ramos with BBVA Compass Bank. And uh, she said access and availability. I grew up in San Antonio. I went away for about 15 years, but now I'm back in the Lone Star State. And I was assigned by BBVA Compass to the border. So you heard Jordana Martin which I'm glad she's in the other room because I can say whatever I want because she's with the Fed, right? And the Wells Fargo's lady's over there and I'm here, so anyway. Uh, the, the point is that uh, Jordana Barton wrote a publication in 2015 about the colonias. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that terminology, but fundamentally, you're talking about po pockets of communities along the Texas border region, if not all the way to California, where you have communities that have, forget about infrastructure for broadband, they don't even have running water and electricity. Right, so government at some point in time decided not to invest in those communities at one level or another. So based on that publication in 2015, she went on in, in 2016, July 2016, revised in December of 16, and she wrote a publication called uh, Addressing the Digital Divide and a framework for banks like ours to invest in trying to change this paradigm. So you talk about access and availability. We're trying to provide access to capital to organizations at every level to invest in those broadband projects and deliver that technology to communities that otherwise didn't. We invested about $100,000 along the border region for a very specific area in Hidalgo County to try to achieve this result. We designated the area so we could size it and determine what was available by government, if they had decided or not, to invest in San Juan, Far, and Alamo. It was a school district called Far San Juan Alamo, that's what it's called. and. Uh, Fundamentally, our scope of investment was simply how do we move this a little bit forward there? If it works there, then let's take it to the lower Rio Grande Valley, which is Brownsville and Arlington, and then how do we take it all the way to El Paso and we'll connect to Laredo as we're on our way to El Paso. So access, availability, absolutely. And then with your point, return on investment, it's just a wise investment for a bank, right? This is a bank now. Mm -hmm. So for us, 
the return on investment is if we provide access to capital through investment or lending to companies that want to bring the broadband to these communities, we're going to have more customers. It's just as simple as that. I'm surprised. You know, the lady was asking, you know, about HEB and shaming HEB because they did the thing in Austin instead of in San Antonio and all that kind of stuff. Why isn't HEB in the room? Why isn't every private sector industry throughout San Antonio in the room? It's in our self-interest, whatever industry you're in, to have broadband brought to your community because they're going to be able to do business with you. So yeah. that's my response, digital yeah. inclusion. Yeah. I think all of us were great responses. I want to remind folks that um, Please feel free to tweet or post up on Instagram or Facebook or just social media. We have a hashtag today, it's, it's connect todos. Um, and I'm not texting up here, I'm taking notes. Um, just in case you guys were wondering why I'm... So uh, my next question... See how fast he is at taking notes on this? Yeah, yeah. 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 it comes from my previous life as a reporter. Um, so. This question is really for Girls Inc. and for the Martinez Street Women's Center, um, so both for Leah and Andrea. Each of you provide direct services to girls and young women that tackle, I'm sorry, that tackle digital inclusion and digital citizenship. Tell me a little bit about the programs that you offer mm -hmm. and how you maximize community relationships to help you scale your offerings. Um, so I can talk about Girls Inc. all day, so just, you know, cut me off at some point. Uh, so the Girls Inc. So how do we provide um, programming um, opportunities for girls to uh, be strong, smart, and bold? So part of it is nothing is just one thing. We can be talking about STEM or um, computer science, but we're also talking about confidence and teamwork and knowing your strengths. So in a broad way, all of the programs we provide, the direct services with girls, whether that's summer camp, all week long, eight to 10 hours a day, whether that's after school for an hour, two hours, whether that's spring break camp, it's all about strong, smart, and bold. And what do I mean by strong, smart, and bold? Strong is healthy. Mentally healthy, physically healthy, emotionally healthy. Smart is graduated from high school. We already saw a graphic today about how many kids don't graduate from high school. Graduate from high school and having a plan for education. Lifelong learning. Bold are all of the life skills that it takes to put strong and smart into effect. So let's talk about STEM, computer access, computer literacy, being safe online. We do. We have a mobile computer, a little, this pretty heavy cart actually, that brings out, you know, laptops and Chromebooks and hotspots wherever we go. We want to go where the girls are. One of the biggest barriers to participation in anything for us, for girls, but it could be of anything, is going to be transportation. Getting to where you need to go. So we go where the girls are. We go to the Saha communities. We go to the schools. We cart you know, the computer technology with us, all right? But it's more than just, you know, okay, so I'm gonna date myself here. I was in, I learned basic computer programming, but <laughs> I have awesome program facilitators that can teach you Scratch and all kinds of other computer type programs to build your own app, <laughs> but that's all well and good. But if you don't know how to be safe online, or if your family says, what are you doing online? There's no way I'm gonna let you have a device because I know what happens online and all you're gonna do is get sucked into something that you shouldn't be participating in, all right? Because your family doesn't have connectivity. It is a very much a multi-level issue. I see lots of nods in the heads, lots of nodding of heads. Um, so how do we combat that? And it's the, one, it's the one word in the title of this panel, it's about the relationships. It's about the relationships. So we can throw resources at a problem. I can have the best trainers, BBVA can have the best economic literacy folks who are going to come into a community and say, I am going to teach you how to balance your checkbook. 
probably not. There's other things to do now in life <laughs> with banking. Okay? Millennials don't have <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay? We can have the best resources, the best information, but without that relationship, nobody is going to come. Right. Nobody is going to come. No one's going to trust Girls Inc. to be with their girls. You know? So it's about that relationship. So how do we do that? It's time. It's time in showing up. We have been in Saha communities where one girl has shown up. Where well, we've done a program that's supposed to be for middle school girls, but the middle school girls can't come because they're supposed to take care of their younger siblings. So we make sure that we have activities for the younger siblings so while we're talking to the middle school girls about being safe online. It's about building the relationship. <coughs> And that gets to the return on the investment. And I'm now really rambling, so I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, so, you know, at, at the Martini Street Women's Center, uh, we have a girls' own program, so it's for girls from the ages of eight uh, all the way up to 18. Uh, but uh, we consider ourselves to be a social justice organization. So what we really want to do is prepare girls to go into the world and make substantial transformative change in their communities. So what, what does that look like? And what does digital inclusion have anything to do with that? And how do we put all those things together? Uh, well, this is how, because we involve them uh, in, those, in those ideas. We talk about those ideas, and I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a campaign, I don't know if you were in the other room when Deanne was talking about net neutrality and, you know, <clears throat> this ongoing uh, battle and, you know, one that uh, we, because of this new administration, we're not in such a great place, right? But the fight isn't over. And <clears throat> what we did was engage our students in that conversation. Now, the word net neutrality or those words uh, I think nobody even had a context of what that means. What does what does net and neutrality mean <laughs> together? And you know, uh, but we know that if we explain it and we explain it in a way that is age appropriate for a girl, no matter what level she's at, that she is going to have an opinion about that, and <clears throat> she is also going to be willing to strategize with you on ways that they can be involved. And so, and so that's, how, that's how we do it. We uh, want to get the girls that are in our program involved. Because if you get uh, you know, a young girl from eight years old that wants to make a change in her community and knows that she can at the age of eight, then what kind of woman are you gonna have walking around the city of San Antonio in several years, and that just makes me kind of like tear up. Uh, but so that's what we do. And for the things that we are not experts in, I'm not an expert in digital inclusion. I'm the I'm just a person in the community who ended up in this job and also cares about all of these things in my community, right? So I and and that's one thing we also tell the girls: you don't have to be an expert to about a topic to care about it to want to do something about it, and uh, you don't have to be an expert to lend a hand in whatever issues you care about. Don't leave it to the experts to you know, change the world or, or make it the way that you want to. You can learn as much as you can uh, up until you, know, you, can't, you have learned everything, which there's never learning everything, that's not a thing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can do that now. And when we are not experts in things, then we partner. We partner and we partner and we partner. So, you know, we just heard from Jake from Systemic. They're reaching out to us to see if they can provide <coughs> services for our youth. And we work with Code Jam every summer <coughs> so that they can come and teach our youth. Uh, <clears throat> we work with Google Fiber. To, so that we can have you know, resources or connections or uh, all sorts of things. Uh, because we understand that the technology that we cannot generally provide for our students uh, and that they don't have access to, 
in their neighborhoods, except now on the east side, we have a bibliotheque, and I am a huge fan of bibliotheque. Uh, we, we use that space all the time, but we need more. And so uh, as we ask our students and we look around and we say, what are the things that you wish were different about your community? Uh, sometimes this, this is part of it. This is part of it because they understand that there are other places in the city of San Antonio where people have their own computers and can get online at home. They understand that and they know that, uh, that they're in a different situation. <clears throat> so I don't know, we have to be creative as well and I'm rambling now, but uh, I, I'm gonna say one more thing. I know that there's an organization here in San Antonio who is doing something uh, with making school parks available to community members. And I, I wish that we could do that as well with school computer labs. Uh, because they're right in their neighborhood. They're right there. That's that's a place. So I don't know pin that maybe we can <laughs> They can walk there too. Yeah that's, I, I hadn't heard of that. I think that's a great point is, you know, how do we open up the resources that already exist in our community? Right so that we can all leverage them and just kind of grow the work that we're doing um Reuben, this question is for you. Um, because of the way the federal government has redefined CRA or Community Reinvestment Act credits to kind of include things like tackling the digital divide, um, what are some of the things that you're evaluating in a community partner and a nonprofit partner like Girls Day, like the Martina Street Women Center, when you're talking <coughs> about putting money towards this problem? What are the things that you want to see um, and what's the ROI that you're looking for? Yeah, no, great question, and, and bo both of my uh, panel colleagues here touched on it a little bit. But we're, we're seeking the, the, the most credible uh, nonprofit organizations that have a track record that have the ability to deliver and, more importantly, provide us measurable impact. That is, can you provide data point about the, the, whether it's the young ladies that you're serving or it's the young girls that you're serving, what neighborhoods are they coming from? Right? So we want certain demographic information about the schools that those uh, young ladies or, or students uh, attend. We want that information. We also want measurable impact in the context of what did they know when they first went into the workshop, and then what did they learn from our team members engaged in helping facilitate these, these workshops. Uh, she mentioned CRA. You know, let me, let me put to bed the, the, the notion that this administration or even this Congress is going to be able to overturn the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. For those of you that don't know, that's just a very simple proposition that banks, if they take deposits from all parts of the community, do a fairly good job of reinvesting dollars and making access to capital available to all of that same community, whether that community be low and moderate in income or upper and middle income uh, a demographic. So uh, I, I don't think there's any uh, uh, progress on the Hill to try to move uh, CRA or water it down in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I think what you're going to see is starting, we're starting to see some more creative ways for the Community Reinvestment Act to be defined because of the digital uh, environment that we're operating in. This framework that Jordana Barton provided us, there, there was never a provision for the banks to have an incentive to invest in these kinds of digital type uh, summits, digital infrastructure projects, or other. It was just another loan. Right now, we get credit for CRA, for investing in bringing technology to some of these low and moderate income communities. With respect to team member engagement, and it's kind of like a three-legged stool I like to talk about, is you've got to bring the broadband and the infrastructure in, and once we have the infrastructure in, now we have to bring the hardware to those communities, because they don't have laptops. And we try to focus on laptops as opposed to tablets or smartphones, because you want, them, you want these kids and you want this this new generation that's never really been touched by this kind of technology, the full Monty of what a laptop and the utility of a, of a laptop bring. So we like laptops, right? And then last but not least is the training, right? So you got the infrastructure, you've got the laptop. Now we have to engage our team members or we partner with strong nonprofits like your two to bring people in. They're not gonna come to the bank, but they'll come to you because they trust you, right? So once we have an, a captive audience, then we're able to train these young folks or this it doesn't have to be young folks it could be an adult 
financial education uh, seminar that's teaching people just simply how to download our app or how to do things on, on a laptop as simple as just Word or, or just spreadsheets. So, uh, so the answer to your question really is we look for the best and the brightest nonprofits in the community, those that have a track record, those that we know that can deliver and that are trusted in their respective communities to bring the captive audience we're looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you also for going over just kind of the history and bringing us up to speed on the... CRA? Yeah, CRA. Um, that was something that I had to learn on the fly about before coming here today. <laughs> <laughs> so this question is for all of you. What are some of the regulations and roadblocks that are preventing us from reaching our goals regarding basic and equitable access to high-speed internet? And how long do you think it'll take for us to change these roadblocks to speed up broadband, sorry, broadband deployment? Kind of a tricky question. It is kind of a tricky question. Um, I, can be, I learned something today that I didn't know. I, you know, um, I'm an, I've often been an advocate that, you know, you would not, I've often said you wouldn't build a house today without having electricity in the house. You, know, you just wouldn't do it, you know. But we, but we can build apartments and houses and not necessarily guarantee connectivity. I did not realize till today that the municipalities in Texas, if, um, the state prohibits them from providing that. That was new information for me today. So how do we overcome that? I greater mind than I could uh, figure that one out. Um, I think it's about being creative. I mean, there is. There is no way to break the cycle of generational poverty. There is no way to inspire lifelong learners. There is no way to encourage savings and retirement and not, and not using payday loans or title loans without access. I mean, we talk about, you know, how to apply for a job. I don't know how you do it without an email address. I don't know how you do it, you know? Um, and I don't know how you do it without an email address that you can check, right? I don't know how you apply for a scholarship if you're in high school on a phone, you know? I mean, I am incredibly uh, impressed that Maria can take notes on this sucker, you know? <laughs> I'm good about taking pictures of the PowerPoint slides. And then maybe remember to go back and look at it, you know? Um, so, we have to get creative. We have to get creative. I love what Saha has done with a technology I didn't even realize, you know, you could do with a mesh network and, you know, um, create a broadcasting out broadband, you know, from solar, you know, uh, light poles kind of thing. Um, that's only gonna get us so far. I love the idea of sharing bandwidth. You know, for how many of us in our in our day to day lives have said to, to your boss, you know, I really don't have the bandwidth to handle that right now. <laughs> okay? <laughs> We've all said that. <laughs> right? I don't know if we have the bandwidth to handle that. All right, so now we're talking about bandwidth in what we really should be talking about bandwidth, and that's the connectivity of it. So how can we share bandwidth? Right? So um, in today's city infrastructure, do you pass an intersection that doesn't have a box that is able to either take broadcast your license plate so it knows when I, you know, went through that red light, kind of, not really, um, you know, or um, has the ability to check your pipe pass or toll tag, you know, what can that box do to broadcast out a signal? I have no idea. <laughs> but it's about being creative like that. And then, so that's the technology infrastructure. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. Then it's about working individually with the people. And if it's going door to door and saying being connected is not scary, you know? Being connected can save your life. Being connected you know, can help your niece, nephew, grandchild, goddaughter, son, you know, um, to graduate high school, you know, to have an answer when his or her friend says, come and join me in um, doing something they shouldn't be doing, that they are tools online, 
you know. Um, that's about that human relationship return on investment. So I think it's how long it's going to take to get there, longer than it should. Um, but it takes conversations like this. It takes people who have given their time, you guys here today, to be part of the conversation, to spark that one idea, to say, I'm going to connect Maria with so-and-so because I met that person at the Digital Inclusion Summit. That's what it's going to take. Um, and, it's going to, and we will do it one step at a time. <clears throat> uh, well, I think that there's a few things. I think that one, it takes partnership. We talked about partnership, but it also takes pressure. Mm -hmm. It takes pressure uh, from the people who are affected. And, and I think that, uh, you know, it's wonderful for us to have these conversations and, and we need to have those conversations, but the conversation is more full and more robust when the people who are the most affected are in the room and at the table. And so until we, you know, get get to that step, which really should be step one in the process, is who is most affected, right? And what is what the understanding the value that that brings to the table. And the nuance and the magic and the conversation and the organizing that comes out of that is, is incredible. So one, having the people who are most affected at the table. Uh, partnerships and pressure uh, to uh, those who have the resources to invest in our communities. Uh, Three, uh, an idea that is springing up around the country and has for a long time, and that's ownership. Ownership of these, uh, of community broadband. Um, and, and how do we do that? Uh, those are, they're big questions. That was a big question. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that we have to do all of the things that people have talked about here. We need to have these conversations. I love the fact that we have a digital inclusion summit here in San Antonio um, because you know we work with national partners like the Praxis Project, who has a community health worker uh, promotoras who are talking about digital inclusion and access in the neighborhoods and and the neighborhoods that are most affected. And uh, you know we were Deanne talked a little bit earlier about Media Action Grassroots Network, so a lot of you know, social justice organizations that get together around the country that know, that understand that even though this is not our primary, you know, mission, uh, it is very much interconnected with what we are trying to do and what uh, the access and the, and the opportunity and the ownership that we want our communities to have um, in the future. So, yes. Uh, for me, it's, uh, I'm going to again, I keep borrowing from both of you, uh, the value proposition, right? The value proposition to stakeholders, both public sector and private sector. For the private sector, it's pretty easy for me, right? Any major industry, it's in their own self-interest to try to want to promote digital inclusion because everything that we're going to do on a move forward basis is going to be based on that smartphone or that tablet or that laptop, everything. Every, I mean, that's just the way it's going. Uh, so from the private sector perspective, we, this room should be full of every major industry segment wanting to know what can they do to do their part to their constituency as it relates to investing in digital inclusion because it's in their self-interest and profitability. So throw out the private sector. Now we get to the public sector. This is where you're going, right? People need to really hear from the people that serve their district, serve their region, serve whatever, at every level of government. What are you doing? to help bring broadband to the community that I live in that you represent? What public sector dollars are you bringing to bear to bring broadband and to bring infrastructure projects to our community, whether it's a Colonia or the west side of San Antonio, to ensure that people have access 
to the same thing that people in Alamo Heights or Terrell Hills or in the Dominion have. At the same speed, by the way. <laughs> let's not sacrifice that, yeah. right? Let's not, let's not go substandard on, you know, oh, well, we brought it, but it's slow. Well, that's not going to help either. And so I will just simply close to just think about that for a moment. Put yourself in someone's shoes that doesn't have this. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a mother, a father, a grandmother, or other, how in the world can you actually thrive in this economy and in this society without technology at your disposal? So digital inclusion to me is kind of a, uh, I mean, it's kind of a no brain <laughs> right? It really is. Uh, whether you're talking about private sector or public sector, it comes down to what you said, the stakeholders in all of this, we're all stakeholders in it, and the sooner that we get around it and start really understanding what it is to do in order to advance this conversation, the better off we're all. And, and by the way, it touches everything. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, education, economic development, affordable housing, it's all connected. With the San Antonio Housing Authority figured that out, right? So uh, it, it just seems to me it's, uh, it's a much broader conversation that needs to be had, and I'm surprised this thing's not standing room only with more people in the room. It does, it affects everything. I mean, even, you know, so we're going through insurance renewals at work. You know, we all go to that, right? Mm -hmm. And I know, right? And they're even talking to us about um, telemedicine. Like, you know, you don't have to go to the clinic, Leah, you know, you know, you're fighting a cold, you can just, I'm like, oh, I'm not even sure how I'm comfortable with that. You know, and I am digitally connected. You know, so if you just think about the future, <laughs> To, you know, to concur with what you said, it, it's, it's all going to be, um, it's all going to involve bandwidth. Um, so we have about seven minutes left, but I love how I think this conversation is helping us segue to the next couple questions. Our conversation here is better than the one you're <laughs> I'm just saying, don't tell the lady from Wells Fargo. So, um, Ruben, you touched on this a little bit. I think everyone kind of did, but. How, the next question that I have, and I'm going to just kind of put both of them together and see if you guys can just kind of rapid fire answer these, but how has the city and county either failed to or come through on helping us close the digital divide? And then in addition to that, what's at stake? Mm. What's at stake for San Antonio's future? How does it impact our education and our economy, housing, you know, all of the things that we talked about kind of being inter interrelated? So I don't know who wants to take that one first, but... I'll take a shot, but I, you know I have, I'm not living in San Antonio now. Uh, somehow I ended up in Houston with BBVA, but but uh, so I, I'm not going to be able to speak to the, the 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 success or failure of Bear County or the city of San Antonio in this context. I, I will tell you that along the border region, they failed and they failed miserably. Uh, and, and and I don't say that with any pride or joy. Uh, the fact of the matter was there were communities along the Texas border region that were forgotten. And we lost a generation of kids, and, uh, and that's unfortunate. And so what's at stake, in my view, is uh, you, you could possibly have a, a, a place where San Antonio just freezes in terms of economic development. Because when you think about it, what we're talking about here, particularly in the context of education, you want a more educated workforce to attract industry and to attract companies to want to headquarter here in San Antonio, besides USA and HGB even though H-E-B took it to Austin. Anyway, the point here is that you, you, you've got to somehow understand that connection. I'm going to be hard on H-E-B or not, and I have an H-E-B. Anyway, so, uh, don't we all have an H-E-B? Anyway, so, so uh, the, the point here is that uh, the, 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 the question of what can be lost, what's at stake, is really the future of San Antonio in the context, and Bear County in the context of economic development. You're going to stop attracting companies here if you don't have an educated workforce, and you're not going to have an educated workforce if these kids don't have access to the internet, right? To your point, how do they apply for scholarships? How do they apply to UTSA or any other school, right? You're also going to limit yourself in the context of, in the healthcare industry, the UT uh, Health Science Center and the medical investments that we've made with those jobs in that industry sector, right? If you don't keep moving this forward and populating those specialty jobs in the healthcare industry, you're going to run into a dead end there. So the, I think the point is that what is at stake is the future of San Antonio. The, the future of San Antonio is going to be tied to how well these organizations can touch the lives of the young ladies that they help with respect to digital inclusion, digital technology, 
instruction and training so that they can advance their careers to higher institutions of education as far as it takes them. And without digital and broadband, you're, in, you're going to go into a debt. A, there's a lot at stake. That's a big question. Uh, but it's kind of a scary proposition. And it happened along the border region, and we're working hard to try to change that. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. I mean, you know, everything's at stake. You know, so we take great pride in San Antonio that one of the fastest growing communities, that um, we have. We have a World Heritage designation with, you know, our awesome, you know, our incredible missions, our incredible history, our incredible culture. We take great pride in what we have here. We also know that we are the most economically segregated city in the country, and that will not change if we don't tackle this. It won't. No matter how excited we are about these other things, we will continue to be the most economically segregated city, period. And we will never get out of that. Never get out of that without tackling these issues. That's what's at stake. You know, I can't imagine living in another city, and I brag about us all the time when I'm with my nonprofit colleagues from around the country, of how collaborative we are, how much we enjoy working together, how much we all want to bring resources to the table, and that is true. I have never been in a room where people don't want to help solve the problem. Instead, I haven't been. And my colleagues around the country go, are you crazy? You guys are competitors. No, we are tackling the same issues. It takes all of us, all right? So we are so good, and I brag about that to others around the country, but we don't want to tackle this, you know, everything's at stake. Everything's at stake. You know, and we haven't addressed it in, in forever. You know, we, I mean, we haven't. As we have created policies, as we, as we have created infrastructure or built schools or brought in companies, I don't think we have made sure that all of the issues are on the, are on the table. You know, we opened up today talking about Hulu, and that when, um, and I wasn't on the economic development panel who talked to Hulu, so I wasn't part of that, but part of the conversation was, you bring your headquarters here, this is an issue, the digital divide is something we want, we'll give you these incentives, but we also want you to be at the table, both with resources and with your brain power to help us solve that. I don't think we were asking those questions. 5, 10, 15, 50 years ago. We have just about a minute left. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to close this out. Close it. <clears throat> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think that, I think that, well, I already talked about the history of our city. And so there are a lot of missteps along that history that have led us to today. For us to be having for us having to look backwards and say, where do we clean up these mistakes? How do we catch up? Because we have invested in, in, in development and we have brought in, you know, what, which is fine, right? But the investment in our neighborhoods and in our people have lacked. And we're barely starting to see the city talk about equity and that's <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful that this conversation is actually happening now, but you know I think the 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 thought that should have been happening many many years ago uh, is why we're in this position now, and so we have got to think not just today, but we have to think 20, 30, 50, 100 years in the future, and think. What do we want for the people of San Antonio? And not just the people that are coming here, the people who are already here, the people who have been here for generations, the people who you know, have been here for 20, 30 years and who are raising families here and you know, who will be here uh, for generations to come. We need to start thinking about the people that are here in San Antonio and what do we want their lives to look like in 100 years so that we don't make the same mistakes that were made throughout the history of this city. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope all of you enjoyed uh, our panelists today.